NCAA national champion, Georgia Southern Eagles. This program is brought to you by Team Baden Azuzu. We are the competition. And by Atlantic Cellular, it's for you, Savannah. Now here's your host, Bill Edwards, and Georgia Southern University head football coach, Tim Stowers. Good evening again, everyone. Welcome to the second Central Florida game. Uh, Tim, we went through this last year where we had to play Middle Tennessee twice, and we were, weren't looking forward to that. I hope the folks aren't lulled to sleep by having to play Central Florida twice and thinking that's going to be a cakewalk. We did, and I was scared to death last time, and I'm twice as scared this time because Central Florida has really settled in to who they want to play at the right position. Their quarterback, Johnson, they settled on him, whereas when they played him before, they were using a three-quarterback system. And that's probably why they had five turnovers in the football game. Uh, they're getting better and better on defense. Gia Cone's doing a great job running the ball. And as all great running backs, the more he rushes the ball, the better he gets during the football game. I mean, they've got great balance. they got the best offensive line in Central Florida history. Uh, they got a great defensive end, Bob Spatulski. I think he's a super football player. He ran down Carl Miller and Joe Ross from the backside on the pitch a couple of times. I'm extremely worried about this football game. In other words, this is a different Central Florida team than we than we played down there, and that was really kind of a deceiving score. We got a couple of good breaks. That's right. The breaks kind of went Georgia Southern's way, and we we made the play in the critical situations in the game. And now, what the the hard thing to overcome is when you play a football team during the regular season, you think, well, maybe it's 38 to it's 38 to 17. But if we can get it out of our mind that it's not 38 to 17 now, yeah. and that it's nothing to nothing now, mm -hmm. and this is a totally different Central Florida football team, maybe we'll be in the right state of mind and have a chance to win. Kind of need the 12th man there too, right? Well, we really do. We need the crowd did a great job last weekend getting in the football game in the in the critical situation in the game, and we need our crowd to really be into the game this Saturday because they can help us win the football game if they want to, if they have that bad case of the wants, just as those 11 football players have a bad case of wants out there. Yeah, let's do it, 12.30. It's 12.30, uh, <laughs> 12.30 kickoff, so they tell me Glen Bryant Field, Paulson Stadium, and the crowd as the football team, they need to be ready to play then. Okay, we'll see you with the first half highlights of the Central Florida game, second version, right after this. It was 50 degrees and overcast when Central Florida and Georgia Southern met for the coin toss as referee Dan Woolridge explained the situation to the team captains. Captain, that's the head. Well, you know what that is. I'm going to toss it and I hope I catch it. If I miss it, I'll toss it again. I'll ask you to call it loud enough for everybody out here to hear you when it's in the air. Yes. Head he calls. Captain, it's a tail. You've won the toss. You can take it now at the first. We're going to start the second half. All right. Blue has won. So for who knows the how many of time in a row, Southern won the toss and elected to defer while UCF mistakenly chose to defend a goal rather than receive. A serious tactical error, so they kicked off to Southern. And the Eagles began the proceedings with quarterback Raymond Gross pitching to Darrell Hopkins on the right corner and Hop went cruising 19 yards to UCF's 40. On second and six, Raymond kept the Eagle Express rolling with a keeper for 10 more yards to the Knights' 26. But from there, the Knights did a great job defending the castle. In fact, on second and 10 from the 16, a pitch to Hopkins actually lost a couple, and a third down pass fell incomplete. So it was time to bring out Mike Dowis, who bisected the crossbar for a 35-yard field goal and a 3 to nothing lead. A lead history tells us Georgia Southern would never relinquish, although you'd have been hard-pressed to find anyone who'd bet the farm on it at that point, especially the way the Knights came out of the gate. Didn't look like they'd waste much time either getting those points back or taking the lead themselves. As quarterback Ron Johnson fired a screen pass to wide receiver Sean Becton on UCF's first play from scrimmage and with good blocking and good speed raced 37 yards to the Southern 37 before Jim Mutimer could bring the proceedings to a halt. But that was not indicative of what was to come. The Southern Inhospitality Committee has never been in such a foul mood. Johnson was sacked on second down by Giff Smith. The ball came loose. As you can see from the replay though, Central Florida's number 66, Andrew Bishop, was just a bit quicker than Steve Busoletti on the recovery. 
A third down pass fell incomplete, so it was time to punt. And if you think that other play went poorly for the Knights, this one really went south, which is what number 16 Chance Ward did when he picked up the loose ball and took off for touchdown territory. But UCF punter Rick Salerno had just enough speed to spoil Chance's moment of glory. And it was fun while it lasted. And I saw the ball on the ground. I just you know, tried to pick it up and run with it. And unfortunately, I got hauled down. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to score a touchdown on that. <laughs> I was wanting to score, too. I saw green. I was trying to go as fast as I could. But I, mean, I tried to do my part, but you know, maybe I'll get it next time. Perhaps so. But while we're handing out accolades, let's credit Hinesville sophomore Ronald Johnson, who had clear sailing to Salerno to block the punt and give Chance a chance. It was clearly celebration time, both on the field and on the sidelines. For Chance, it was like going to Six Flags. A sideline ride from Alonzo McGee and Brad Allman. And just for emphasis, to quote Marv Albert, yes! That's something we work on. We kind of put a lot of emphasis, a lot of emphasis on that, because a lot of people, just like you said, you know, don't pay too much attention to special teams, but Coach Mack makes sure we, uh, we do just the opposite of that each, every day of the week. Great play. It didn't look like it looked like you were back there as fast as the football was. Yeah, I had, I had no idea. I was just surprised everybody else that it, that it opened up like it did. From the way they were lined up, you know, I thought they were going to do a, just, you know, protect. But as soon as the ball was snapped, they both, the guard and tackle went, went their separate ways and just left me wide open. So <laughs> I had no choice to go straight ahead. Unfortunately, Georgia Southern got nothing out of it. A third and eight pass to Carl Miller gained only five. And then Mike Dowis pulled a rarity, pulling a 26-yard field goal attempt to the left. The score remained 3-0. Again, UCF started like gangbusters when tailback Mark Giacone took off for 22 yards through the middle before Jim Mutimer literally wrestled him to the turf at their 42. But just as sure as the sun comes up in the east on third and five, Ron Johnson lost four yards when Curtis Gordon paid him a visit. And after the punt, the Eagle Express started to look like its old self momentarily. Raymond ducking trouble and arching a 33-yard rainbow to Carl Miller at the UCF 42. But the Knights have a pretty good defender in number 56, Bob Spitalski, who on third and seven sacked Gross to bring up fourth and 12 at the 31. So the Eagles decided to dial long distance with David Cool giving it the old college try from 48 yards and David nailed it. Six nothing Eagles after a quarter of play. That fired up the defense even more. Watch the top of your screen. Number 96, Steve Busoletti fighting off his blocker and dropping Ron Johnson for a two yard loss to bring up third and 12. Then it was Giff Smith sacking Johnson for another two yard loss. The defense was pumped. After the first game, we knew they weren't going to do much different, you know, run much different stuff. And uh, we came in with a game plan. We're going to have to start, stop the run and then, you know, stop the pass. And if we knew they were going to start passing and that they were behind and, you know, we were in a good position. With Alf and friends and even an Alabama fan, among others, cheering the Eagles on, they began to move in big chunks late in the half. Third and 12, a pass to Terrence Sorrell was just what the doctor ordered. 16 yards up to the 48. A pitch to Joe Ross around the left end two plays later, netted 14 more to the Knights 27 when Joe found a crease down the left side. And on second down, vintage Raymond scrambling out of the pocket and throwing on the run to Daryl Belzer, who made a great jumping catch, 13 more to the enemy 15. <clears throat> but to make a long story short, however, the Eagles wound up with fourth and 22 at the UCF 27. So Mr. Cool, if you please, and David's 44-yard field goal may still be going should be in Kansas about now, 9-0 Southern with 107 to go. But boy, what Central Florida did with those 67 seconds was frightening. On first and 10 from their own 41, Ron Johnson rifled a shot to Sean Jefferson for 41 yards before Brad Ullman could drag him down at the 18. And three plays later, five seconds to go, Johnson made it look ridiculously easy, zipping it right over the middle to Sean Becton, and it was 9-7 at intermission which didn't set well with lots of folks, especially defensive end Giff Smith. We, we felt like uh, they, didn't, they couldn't move the ball on us, and we, we consider that kind of a cheap touchdown late in the game. You know, they, they did a good job of scoring, but we felt like we didn't do our job. We kind of let up at the end. 
but meet a group that never lets up, the GSU cheerleaders, as we chat with Coach Susan Norton at halftime. It's our pleasure to have as our halftime guest, Susan Norton, who is the cheerleading coach here at Georgia Southern. And a lot of people may not realize that cheerleaders have coaches just as football players or basketball players or volleyball players, Susan. Right, that's very true. And more and more universities are going to having coaches. Um, it helps when you've got someone who knows the techniques of cheerleading who can make sure that your squad is performing at a level where they need to perform, doing crowd involvement type material, also their partner stunt pyramids. There is a safety factor involved in coaching. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're definitely athletes, and, and many people don't realize that. Uh, they're true gymnasts also, mm -hmm. so they, they practice very hard. It takes a lot of athletic skill. The guys have a lot of um, coordination and timing. The girls have to have great balance, and you know, I'm really fortunate that all my girls and all my guys are very talented this year. Tell me about a cheerleader practice, and secondly, there are a lot of competitions and camps and stuff that you folks do, right? Right. Um, the cheerleaders start their practice in the spring. We try out in April, and they have a, a full practice schedule that goes to the end of school. They have a conditioning program that they participate in over the summer. We come back in in August and practice for about a week. Then we go to camp where we compete against various other schools and learn new material to bring back home. Uh, during the season, during football season, we practice three to four, sometimes five times a week if necessary. Um, and then during basketball season, we taper that off to about three times a week because often we have games during the week. Uh, the cheerleaders also compete um, just like a football team or a basketball team, soccer team, anything competes. Uh, we compete against other schools. and. Uh, what that involves is um, at camp we are evaluated on our cheer, fight song, and chant, um, and that that You're generally done pretty well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. This year they had we had our best camp performance ever, and we placed in the top four in all three categories, and we were the only squad in our division to do so. People don't realize what it takes for a girl to be able to stand up in in on one foot in a guy's hand and yeah. just stand there and make it look so easy. And they've got great personality. Yeah, they do. They really do. They work very hard, and and they enjoy it. And they've got the longest season on campus, right? Yeah, we we cheer both football and basketball, and they will go um, after basketball, of course, we'll be gearing up for nationals, and so they will go through April, and then they, the next week, they'll try out again for next year's squad. <laughs> Our real priority, of course, is crowd involvement, and a lot of the material that we learn at camp is geared toward crowd involvement, easy cheers, um, short words, things that the crowd will follow. And so we've really worked on that this year with use of signs and, and using our partner stunts to get the girls in the air in front of the in front of the crowd. And that's working real well for us. We've had some real good crowd response this year, and I hope it'll continue this week and hopefully next week. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks okay. for having us. Our halftime guest has been Susan Norton, who is the cheerleading coach here at Georgia Southern. So come on out and cheer the Eagles on and cheer with the cheerleaders. We'll see you with the second half of the Central Florida game after this. Georgia Southern needed to get something started and give Central Florida, along with their coach, an attitude adjustment. And so the lesson began with the kickoff. Taken by Herman Gray, a Fairfax, South Carolina sophomore who ran into and out of trouble at the 31, shifted direction, and headed upfield, and nearly got to the 50. Then the Eagle Express, which had wheezed and sputtered throughout the first half, began to perform like Clark Kent after the phone booth change. On the first play from scrimmage, Joe Ross took Raymond's pitch, turned the left corner, and Ross was boss. Moving through an opening, John Wilson and Carl Miller helped create. Then angling back toward the sidelines, Joe outraced the Knights to rescue the damsel in distress. It looked like the Joe Ross of old with healthy knees and great speed. Like a human freight train destined not to stop till it reached its destination. We've been running that play all year a lot. So a lot of people coached up how to uh, defend it. So this, uh, in halftime, we um, changed up uh, the blocking scheme. I don't know if they could have caught me, but I, I was sure worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you think when you, when you saw yourself open down the sidelines, did you think you had a chance? Well, I thought I had a chance, but, you know, I really had to turn it on and uh, hope to maybe grab some speed from the stands or something because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not the same old guy anymore. So. Well, you know, we, we didn't execute the first half, and they played a great defensive game this first half, and 
you know, I think we came out and Joe had the big run and then Mark had the interception and it kind of took it out of him. And, you know, once we got on the roll, it was hard for us to be stopped. Meanwhile, the GSU defense was getting more sacks than a potato packing plan. On second and six, Curtis Gordon dumped Ron Johnson for an eight yard loss in all 10 sacks for the Eagle defense Saturday. Then that interception Raymond mentioned a possession later. Watch the top of your screen as Curtis Gordon bats this one sky high and Mark Giles picks it out of the air. He too would drop it, but it went out of bounds before anyone else could get it. Southern's ball at the 50. Then it was time to take the Eagle Express back to Touchdown City, and the trip began with a 16-yard hookup to Carl Miller. And then on third and goal from the 10, no sputtering this time. Raymond dropped back and zipped it to well-covered, but open, Daryl Belzer. Great catch. It was 23-7 GSU after Mike Dowis' extra point. But nobody was wearing a bigger smile in Paulson Stadium Saturday afternoon than Tony Belzer, Darrell's older brother, who'd caught one or two of those himself when he, too, wore eagle blue. Yeah, uh, Coach Russell showed confidence in me to, uh, to call that route. It was, a, it was a design backside route to hit me on the out, uh, go into a post and come back to the out route. And uh, he had enough confidence in me, and uh, I got the job done. The Eagle defenders continued to punch holes in the Knights' armor. From their 26, Giff Smith dumped Mr. Johnson for an eight-yard loss. And on third and 18, it went from bad to worse as Johnson fired to Sean Beckton, who had it for a moment, we think, and dropped it. Safety Don Hudson recovered. The officials decided it was a fumble, and Southern was in business at the UCF 38 as the third period wound down. It seemed certain the Eagles were flying back into the national championship, and the legend who got the tradition soaring looked on. Then the Eagles began the fourth quarter just as they had the third. From the how do they do that department, Raymond scrambled out of trouble and launched a rocket to train. Carl Miller, who also escaped the defender, cut back inside, and it was 30 to seven screaming Eagles as the attitude adjustment continued. Raymond did a great job. I thought he was great to go down. And uh, I, I ran past the defender. They kind of went to the inside. I think they were looking at Terrence Sorrell. They thought he was going to catch the ball. And I thought Raymond was down, and, and he came out of there. He was stumbling. He looked up and saw me, got me the ball. And I just made a pretty, you know, <laughs> average cut. <laughs> average, like a custom-built Gulfstream 4, is an average airplane. There's not really much you can say as you know, about Carl, once he gets the ball and what type of receiver and runner he is, uh, you know, he's, he's contributed a whole lot all season, and, you know, he's made the big play for us, and, you know, that's Carl, and he, lo he loves, you know, to, to make things happen, and, you know, he's a great guy, and it couldn't happen to anybody better. By now, guys like Steve Busoletti and the rest of the Southern Inn Hospitality Committee were taking no prisoners, having a field day, completely shutting down the Knights' attack and winning praise from their offensive brethren. And defense played a great game. We put a lot of pressure on them in some tough situations. Some, they had some good field position, and, and, and the defense just came through and took care of business. Defense played a, a great game, and the, and the kick, kickers uh, came through for us again. You know. Dallas and, and, and Cool and, and Terry did a great job when we didn't, you know, get the ball into the end zone. And defense and the defensive coaches did a super job, and they were in the right state of mind, and they basically just weren't going to be denied victory today. Nor were they going to be denied the end zone anymore. The defense was awesome. Watch 92 Jack Harris recover from a block, get off the deck, and drop Ron Johnson for a five-yard loss at the night zone 15. But Harris wasn't through. On third and 20, he came bearing down on Johnson like a heat-seeking missile, and a punting situation had arisen. And when you're hot, you're hot. Punter Russ Salerno found the pigskin too hot to handle. And instead of taking a safety, he decided to step out of the end zone. A safety would have been the wise decision. It was Southern's ball, first and goal, a foot or less away. And on the first play, Alonzo McGee hit pay dirt at right guard and right tackle. 37 to seven, it had turned into a good old fashioned route with Mike Dowis extra point, true blue as usual. The Knights then tried a new set of armor. Quarterback Rudy Jones came off the bench and it worked about as well as everything else they tried. While Southern's new quarterback, Albert Huntley, showed the Eagles hadn't missed a step. On a keeper to the right, Albert galloped 14 yards to the Knights 12 after a personal foul was assessed that you'll see coming up right here. 
Two plays later, on third and 13, from the 15, on a draw play, the southern line opened a hole the size of I-95, like the one back to Florida, and it was Lester Eifert going across the moat, back into the castle without having to break a sweat. Left guard Miguel Ayub, a freshman out of Jacksonville, was pleased with their performance. It was just a couple plays that kept stopping us, and I uh, went in halftime, got them worked out, and I uh, knew that we were a better team than them, although they were a good team. And uh, everything came together in the second half, and we, we just rolled to a victory. And on to our second showdown in four years with the University of Nevada next Saturday, this time for the crown. And Coach Stowers will have final comments in a moment.